Welcome back, everybody, to the Birdies of Bourbon Show. Hey, we are excited today to have PGA instructor Scott Watkins on with us. Uh, Scott, thanks so much for taking some time to join us today. Looking forward to the conversation. Uh, yeah, you're uh, so Scott's uh, Scott's playing out of uh, Papago Golf Course uh, at the moment, or currently, I should say. Uh, and I think you've been there for a few years. Um, if you don't. Years couple of years yeah, yeah. And, uh, and and obviously in Phoenix Arizona it's probably it's probably only like 111 there today right so. <laughs> that's it <laughs> so yeah we were uh, we, we were cutting up a little before uh, before we started recording so uh, he said uh, but it's a dry heat so I'm like yeah I've been, I, I, I've been out there in the summertime I know what dry yeah. heat feels we've like. been out there in the summertime it's, it's an <laughs> oven <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so real, uh, I, I'd like to say real quick, but, uh, man, this guy's, uh, decorated. So a lot of accomplishments and, and awards. So, uh, I don't want to blow through them and, uh, and discount anything. So, uh, just give a little brief background of, uh, kind of your pedigree, Scott, and then you can expand okay. and, and, and make an introduction for yourself. So, uh, again, he's a golf instructor at Papago Golf Course in Phoenix. He's a Titleist staff member. Uh, degree in business administration from ASU. We definitely want to talk about what it was like playing with Phil there. Not to make this about. <laughs> <laughs> He's um, a little younger than I am. <laughs> yeah. I'll quit bragging. Um, <laughs> so, just some of the accomplishments and award that Scott has. So, Pac 10 Player of the Year, first and second team All American at ASU, uh, Southwest Section PGA Section Player of the Year, Southwest Section PGA Teacher of the Year, five time nominee for Golf Magazine Top 100 Golf Instructors. I definitely want to get into that. I was reading up on you. You had some colorful comments about that one. Um, <laughs> ranked 9th, 12th, 11th, 7th in 2009, 10, 11, and 13, respectively. Uh, and won the Southwest Section Championship four times and the Arizona Open. Wow. That is a hell of a mouthful. And, sir, uh, I'll raise a glass to you, man. That, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a heck of a pedigree. Thanks so much for coming on with us today again. And uh, I'll, sh I'll shut up for a minute and uh, let you introduce yourself. Well, um, I, I, I'll give you a little background on my golf. I really didn't start playing till summer before high school. My dad was actually the first head pro at Papago back in 1963 when it opened. And uh, I, I played football, I played basketball, I ran track, I did uh, uh, you know, all the other sports. Baseball was what I loved the most. But when you're five feet tall and 100 pounds the first day of your <laughs> freshman year, and the first two weeks of, of tryouts in freshman football, I got killed because I was so small. I had just taken up golf, so I said, okay, I want to be a professional athlete. A little guy can play golf, so uh, I just did seven days a week golf. My dad's at the golf course six days a week, so I improved really fast. I shot – Papago hosted the 1971 USGA Pub Links, to give you an idea that it's, you know, it's a, obviously a good golf course. Uh, I shot 100 there September of my freshman year and shot 73 by April uh, wow. of my freshman year. So, but, you know, it's constant practice. I loved it. My dad was there, so I didn't get a lot of bad habits. Or at least if I did, they weren't there very long. And uh, he was a, a really accomplished uh, teacher himself. Uh, taught a lot of uh, the ASU guys going through there and some tour pros back in the day. Yeah, I think he even gave Jim McLean a couple lessons back when Jim was a young guy. Um, but anyway, so I grew up at Papago. So coming back to Papago about two years ago is kind of homecoming for me. So, yeah. um, and you know, after I got a pot belly pig here that's walking by me. <laughs> <laughs> What's his name? What's his name? It's I got to let her out. It's Dolly. Dolly. All right. That's cool. <laughs> there she goes, Grunton. Go on, Dolly. Go on. Hey, Cal. He went from 100 to 71. I gotta, I, I got, I'm gonna have to get on the plane. You can finish this up, right? Because if he can shave 30 off my swing, I'm good. I'm, I'm gonna well, get on the plane right now. <laughs> well, we're we're gonna get there. We're gonna get there during our conversation. I mean, that's uh, you know, and I, I don't want to steal uh, steal uh, Scott's thunder, but uh, I mean, that that's kind of his mantra or mission statement, right? It's, I mean, how fast can I get you to? Uh, in Dan's case, and excuse my <laughs> excuse my language, how fast can I get you sh get you from shitty to at least decent? So anyway, well Dolly's out of the room now. So oh, um, so anyway, I mean, I, I had a you know did did pretty well in high school, and then you know you saw what I did in, in college. Um, 
with the All-American stuff. I played the PGA Tour for four years right out of college. Um, you know, didn't have really any success per se. Um, and then got out of the, off the tour. I left it. I had about four or five weeks left to go in that final season. I just left and said, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, and, and the first three years were the, uh, the top 160 format. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where the top 60 were fully exempt and the other hundred that kept their cards had to qualify on Mondays with the guys coming out of the tour school. Okay. Um, so it was a lot different format. If you missed the cut, you had to hurry up, get to the next town, get ready to qualify on Monday and so on and so forth. If you made the cut back then, you were exempt the following week. Oh. Um, so it was hard to plan where you're going to be because if you weren't in that top 60, you were always chasing Mondays if you happen to play poorly and miss the cut. So uh, my last year on, in 1980, I played 80, 81, 82, and 84. So I, there was a year I was off. In 83 is when they went to the, the, the current format of top okay. 125 fully exempt. So, okay. um, And just to show you the difference in, in what you could make out there, my rookie year in 1980, I think that if you added up the 44 events, it added up to 12 and a half million wow. total year first. Oh, wow. yeah. And now that's the first two tournaments of the year. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's a weekend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, it was a little different back then. Yeah. Uh, in, any any uh, memorable moments that you would want to share? I, I mean, you oh, know. Sure. Just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Was, How about it? I was playing in, in Tucson at Tucson National and I had Willie Peterson on my bag. Uh, Willie Peterson was the caddy that Nicholas had at all his Masters victories before they allowed the color barrier to be broken for the caddies. Then he used uh, Jackie, sure. his son. Sure. So Willie was on my bag, and we're on the second hole, which is my 11th hole. And the the El Conquistadors are the civic group that, that basically hosts that event. It's like the Phoenix Thunderbirds at the Phoenix Open or the people that organize and run the tournament, raise the money, and that type of stuff. Well, anyway, two of those guys drive up with a county sheriff. Oh my God. Out in the middle, we're out in the middle of the fairway, right? Okay. I actually hit the fairway. So <laughs> anyway, they drive up and they say, you know, are you Willie Peterson? And he says, yeah. I said, well, come with me. So they give me an El Conquistador to carry the bag. So now, you know, and, and Willie's helping with, with yardages. If I asked about Rena Green, he would help me. Now I got a guy that can't hardly carry a bag. <laughs> and so anyway, I finished the round. And about 10 minutes later, Willie comes walking up. I said, what was that going on? He says, well, they were investigating me for the Man Act. And I don't know if you know what the Man Act is, but the Man Act is, is if, if an adult takes a minor of the opposite sex across, while they're just the two of them, across the state line, it's called the Man Act. It's a federal offense. Um, so anyway, there was some young gal sitting up in his Cadillac, didn't have any ID on her. She was just waiting for him. And, you know, the sheriff obviously was interviewing him. She couldn't prove her. or She looked young, of course. He's probably <laughs> 50 at the time. And uh, she couldn't prove how old she was. Oh, boy. So I'm, I'm thinking, okay, she's not crying foul. She's perfectly fine. She's safe. There's no hurry. They couldn't wait an hour and a half till we finished the round. They know he's going to be at the end of the ninth green in an hour and a half because yeah. he has no <laughs> idea what's going on. So it's like, you know, it disrupted the flow of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I'm going, you got to be kidding me. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine something like that? I mean, there's no way that anything like that happens. Now, I mean, forget the, you know, the, the I shouldn't say forget, but I mean, you know, the race barrier aside, Right. Uh, you know, just interrupting somebody, you know, you take a picture of somebody right now and they're having a meltdown, much less, you right. know, pulling up and saying, Hey, we're taking your caddy. You get this guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, that was just one incident. But, uh, anyway, it was kind of, it was kind of different for sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd say. Um, so what's, uh, so what's going on at, uh, I, I, I've always called it Papago. So I guess it's Papago though. Uh, uh it's called both Papago. Okay. Papago. All right. And I've played there a couple of times. Um, so, and, and nice track. Uh, right. you know, a great track, actually. So, uh, is ASU still play out of there? Or? ASU, yeah. When was the last time you were there? Uh, let's see. Well, I mean, the last time I played there, I think, was 2017. But I've been to Phoenix okay. several times after that. Okay. So. so, since you've been there, it was probably a double-wide trailer for a pro shop. Yeah, um, yep. 
they built a new clubhouse. Uh, oh, they built cool. a pavilion, which is kind of a banquet hall. And then ASU, they re totally redid the range because they, they built a facility for the ASU men's and women's teams there, uh, which is supposed to be the best facility in the country for a college team. Phil Mickelson designed all the practice areas for them. So, for example, they've got a huge rectangular green, and 25% of it has a 1% grade, then there's a 2% grade, then there's a 3% grade, and a 4% grade. So if you're doing aim point and that type of stuff, they know exactly what that grade feels like. They got four target greens in the short game area that, you know, I think I could probably hit an eight or nine iron from one to the other. <laughs> if that's how big of an area it is. Oh, so they, And there's moguls everywhere. Three of those target greens have bunkers. They have their own driving range that, that goes kind of diagonally but kind of somewhat parallel with the, the, the public's driving range. But you don't even know their driving range is there because there's just enough mounding in between them. Sure. The end of the building's got uh, two track, a uh, garage door that rolls up, two track man in there. They've got a, I don't even know what it's called. They got one of those big putting decks that you can change from straight to making a curve. Oh yeah. It's an elevated deck that you stand on and they, they can move it. They got a Sam putting lab on that. They've got a almost a kitchen. You got a refrigerator and a water dispensing machine, an ice dispensing machine, a place to eat. Study hall room, locker rooms like crazy, and I mean, if you can't, I tell everybody, if you can't recruit with, for what the facility they have now, you suck at recruiting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, you played there, and I mean, just start running through the list of players, right? And and, and we'll uh, we we don't want to make it about uh, about the golf course by any means. We you know we invited oh. you on as a guest, but. You know, I mean, look at number one in the world right now, man. Right. I mean, um, uh, fellow alumni, right? I mean, that, that's right. got to be a good feeling. John Rom, yeah, he was he was out there just on the public putting green about two weeks before he won. So he was in town and just walked over there. And nobody's bugging him. Probably didn't even recognize him and yeah, went away. So, but yeah, that, yeah. that facility is something else, and yeah. uh, it's it's pretty cool. But I mean, I don't go over there and use it at all. But um, I just yeah. keep kind of somewhat next to it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the amazing thing, someone told me that Phil Mickelson, with, with his career, has never been ranked number one in the world. That's correct, yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Isn't that hard to believe? Mm -hmm. it, right. It's pro it's probably because of those glasses and those skinny jeans he's wearing, skinny pants he's wearing these days. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, hey, he's like, I, I'm not admitting I'm 50 yet, man. He's still holding right. on. <laughs> his calf's too big. That's the problem. That's what it is. That's what it is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I was uh, I was listening to Rom do a press conference today, and uh, he mentioned that because I think he's big pals with Phil, and he mentioned that even even with all his victories and whatnot, he was never number one. And they were asking John, you know, what does it mean to you and all that kind of stuff. And they were talking about you know how long do you want to keep it. And it just the guy was really humble about the whole thing, and just yeah. uh, I think he's just in a great spot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think he's a pretty well grounded guy. I mean, I, I know he didn't come from wealth in Spain, and and I think it was kind of like a Sebi story where they didn't really have a whole lot of money, and yeah, and uh, but man, that guy's got some talent. <laughs> yeah, he does. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah. Well, hey, Scott, let, let's uh, let's get into Scott Watkins a little bit more, and uh, and and your uh, and your teaching philosophy. I know you. I, I mentioned your mission statement. It's you know how do I get you? How do I get you from where you are to better as fast as I can? So right. you, you want to break it down for the listeners? I mean, what's uh, kind of give you know what if I'm if I'm coming to you and it's like, hey, I need some help. I mean, what's that assessment look like? What are we going through? I mean, what, uh, what what's kind of the routine? What's the Scott Watkins routine? OK, well, basically, well, I had a beginner this morning and she came up. But, you know, one of the first things I'm going to ask you is, OK, what are your goals? What are you looking for? Uh, what's going on in your game? What's a good shot look like? What's a bad shit look like, uh, shot look like? And then also I'm going to ask you, you got any physical ailments like bad backs, knees, hips, because i got to know uh, what's going on there because uh, there's a lot of times, if you ever watch anybody that plays golf with a bad back, they tend to want to freeze their lower back and their hips and don't move them, which is totally opposite of what they should do because they're mm -hmm. still going to turn their shoulders when their hips are frozen, which means they're torque on their spine. So, mm -hmm. But I go through, through, you know, the beginner the first time through, I'm going to go through, or just a new student, through all that question and answer routine just so I can get a feel for what their game's like, what their goals are, and what their body's like. Because uh, there's going to be times where I might want to have them do something, but I know they physically can't do it because either they don't have the flexibility, the strength, or they got an injury. Um, so uh, just for example, 
back in 2000, well, I, I've got digital video equipment. I use JC video equipment. And uh, so as far part of the assessment, I'm going to have them warm up and hit some balls, and we'll take a look at the video. And mm -hmm. I'll go through and point out what I think we should do uh, or what, what issues they have and then what we are going to do that day. Uh, I did find out early in my teaching career that being a young full-time instructor, I wanted to teach them everything I knew about the golf swing in an hour. And I found out I was over-teaching when I, at the end <laughs> of the lessons, I kept saying, well, forget everything I said, just focus on this. And yeah. that's when I realized about a month or two in, I was over-teaching. But, mm -hmm. but I'll go through with the video, and, and back then I didn't have video, but I'll go through with the video and show them what, we, what they're doing, and then I'll say, okay, but here's the area we're going to focus at. And uh, so then we'll we'll work on that. You know, obviously basics initially is grip setup, uh, posture, and all that kind of stuff. But um, but I do look out, and I don't know. I, I've watched a lot of golf instructors that I've taught next to or at the same facilities. I do look out for things that could cause bad backs and hurt themselves. For example, back in 2000. I had on my library swings of Tiger Woods, and I predicted that if Tiger didn't catch Jack Nicklaus in the major championship run, it's going to be because of his back. Mm. And I didn't you realize you nailed that one. Back surgeries, right? <laughs> but the reason why is is his stance is too wide, and if you ever watch, especially his older stuff, his stance is too wide. So when he follows through, his right leg is straight, so his femur, right femur is angled backwards, and that immediately tightens up the right glute and the right side of the lower back. And then he over-rotates his shoulders so severely, he's, what's stopping his swing back then is his spine can't turn anymore. Hmm. So I, I pay a lot of a close attention to the width of the stance. The forward foot's going to be flared a little bit. That lets you turn on the forward leg. Uh, I won't let my students over-rotate shoulders like Tiger. Um, and I could tell, go on and on on how why Tiger's shoulders over rotate, but uh, it just has a lot to do with how he recocks and folds his elbows. Hey, so uh, I, don't, I don't mean to cut you off, but just a question yeah. on that. So just thinking through, right, and, and uh, I'm thinking about Dan's swing and how it's nothing oh, like Tiger's. Man. Uh, but, but not, you know, I mean, nobody can discount Tiger, right? I mean, it, it, yeah. it's happened. It, but he's been through the cycle of, uh, you know, coaches – trainer, you know, whatever, whatever you guys want to call yourselves, right? So do you think that, is that, is that tiger driven or do you think that's just, uh, is that going, you know, is it, is it the number of coaches he's had through his career or the, what, what do you think that's driving that, uh, that, that move, right? Or moves in the golf swing? Well, it, just watching his swing in his career, I mean, it, obviously they were all focusing on how well he hit it. And nobody was focusing on what that swing's doing to his health. Um, so if, if Tiger Woods would have come to me 15 years ago, the first thing I'd say is, I don't care how well you hit it, but you got to cut your follow through short, or you're going to hurt yourself. Wow. So if you if you can cut your follow through short, and you don't have to cut the speed, but you just got to learn how to stop the speed, and yeah. you never have to learn how to stop it. And um, I, I didn't tell you guys, but I've spent a lot of time with Mac O'Grady since. Gosh, 19, well, he helped me a little bit in, when I was on the tour in 90, or 84, 1984, um, when he first started doing his research. But in 90, since 1998, I spent quite a time, a lot of time with him. So I lot, learned a lot about the biomechanics and that type of stuff. Uh, believe me, I'm not a scientist at all. <laughs> but, but that's what got me into watching out for that stuff is, you know, you can create tremendous speed, but you got to learn how to stop it. Yeah. And, that would have probably been the first thing I would have told Tiger is, look, you got to learn how to stop the speed as, as it's coming back at you so it doesn't corkscrew you into the ground or tear your back up. So, And then we can worry about how well you hit it. <laughs> but, I mean, that, that's no – I mean, that's not driving any of the uh, – you know, just as far as the ball striking goes. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's happening well after you've struck the right. ball. So, you know. Right. It's just learning how to stop the speed. Yeah. And what, what, what happens is, is, is you know, as, as you're going into the follow through after impact, both your elbows are reasonably close together when the arm's extended. Mm -hmm. But what happens is, is his left elbow starts separating from his right elbow. And as it does it, that left arm can't, is not in position to slow the swing down. Sure. So his left elbow swings around past his left shoulder and his shoulders keep turning. And eventually it's his lower back that stops it. 
and then add insult to injury with that straighter right leg, he's already tightened up the right glute, the right side of his lower back, and then he twists his shoulders and just wrenches his back. Yeah, everything's just kind of contorted, I guess, right? It's just right. Ringing, it, you're ringing yourself out, kind of, right? So. And everybody, you know, all the young kids that think, growing up watching him, are thinking, this is cool, we got to swing like Tiger, now we, now we got to, you know, maybe I should have been a chiropractor and just fall <laughs> down, you know, or a physical therapist. Well, yeah. so, so it's interesting you go there. And that, so if you don't mind, I'd like to stay there for just a minute. Yeah. So as an, as an instructor, so, so we've talked about Tiger and, and kind of how, you know, it, it's like, you know, it, it's just life, right? I mean, if you're talking about golf, you're going to talk about Tiger. So do, we'll, right. we'll move past that. Um, and, and, but you're talking about how, hey, you know, that looks injury ridden to me and, and you called it, right? And he's, you know, now he's got a fuse back and, you know, he, he, interview after interview, he's like, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. It's not a good thing. So, so now let's fast forward. Uh, what is he, 44? And then you got DeChambeau that's what, like mid 20s. So, right. you know, so, so move forward 20 years and now you've got a, you've got DeChambeau that's doing the, uh, you know, six protein shake a day and, uh, all the, right. you know, all the calories I can ingest. So, so let's, uh, you, you heard it here, uh, the birdies and bourbon show. Uh, so Scott, what's your, what's your forecast for what's going to happen to, uh, for, to DeChambeau? I mean, what's he turning himself into? Uh, you know, I haven't really watched, I don't watch much golf on TV anymore, but, um, but anyway, I haven't watched his swing much lately, but I, I do think from what I've seen, I think his right leg is kind of straight in the finish. His right knee or right leg. I don't think he lets his oh, right yeah. knee come to his left. Mm -hmm. So that's an issue. And I haven't watched to see. I think he over rotates his shoulders a little bit too. Oh, it's. I mean, that's 240 pounds. I mean, he says 240. Right. I think it's like a boxer. He's probably like 265. You know, he just comes right. on the card but, at 240. But if, 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 he, if he lets his shoulders spin around like Tiger, it, I don't care how strong or how flexible his muscles are. If he torques his spine that far, the vertebrae can only turn so far. Yeah. And you keep pounding those vertebrae tight, tight, tight. Eventually, that disc between them kind of pops out, and you got a bulging disc. Mm. And that's yeah. what and the tiger, because I think the first three surgeries, they were trimming the disc, the micro dichotomy. Yep. And then finally, they just said, we got to fuse it. Well, the problem with fusing is, is now the problem is above the vertebrae that's fused and below the bottom vertebrae. Now that's where the stress goes. So you still got to, you still can't keep swinging the same way. If that's what's caused the problem. Yeah, sure. And I don't know that, you know, with him, or Tiger, for example, twisting that much on his left knee was the left knee problem. I thought he injured it doing some some of his... Uh, yeah, he was Navy sealing it, climbing walls Navy, or doing yeah, something. Yeah, Navy seal stuff, as I was just going to say, the first injury, so... Yeah. Well, that's but one thing that Bishim... I'm sorry. With, with, with him swinging that hard, if he doesn't stop that speed after impact as it comes back at him, he could have the same problem too. Yeah, I, I did right. notice with Bryson that with his finish, at least on the the left leg, that the that foot is completely open when oh, when nice. he finishes. He it completely opens out. that foot up. Yeah, yeah. And you'll you'll see a lot of people. Uh, one of the first things I'll do in the setup is have the person flare that front foot out, 15, 20, 25 mm -hmm. degrees. Not mm -hmm. quite like Trevino did. Mm -hmm. But the, the more you square that front foot off, it re the ankle, the knee, and hip are going to lock up as you rotate on the front leg, and you can't get your hips all the way around to 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. So if you flare the forward foot, now I can get my hips through. Well, what happens to some of these guys is they're turning their hips even past 90 degrees in the follow through, and the ankle, the knee, and hip are going to lock up. So what happens is the left foot gives way, and it spins out. Mm -hmm. Normally, when you see that left foot spinning out on someone, it's almost like the left foot telling you, hey, you didn't have me flared out enough at a dress. So if something has to give. Either your hip, your knee, or your ankle is going to go. If you kept your left foot perfectly squared off and kept cranking your hips 90 degrees or past. Mm. But, Interesting. You know, Interesting. But it, it's just that, you know, I've had, I've been teaching full time since February 1st of 91, so almost 30 years. I just had so many people come to me with different injuries, and as soon as they tell me they got an injury, I'm looking at their swing to figure out, okay, are you doing anything in the golf swing that's aggravating that? And if so, we're going to address that first, so we don't keep aggravating that. That way you can get more balls per day, more days per week, more weeks per month, and so on and so forth. So it's, it, it, it's become a lot more violent sport, uh, a violent action with these guys growing up with this high-tech equipment that you can swing so hard at 
and hit it so far and it's so forgiving. Well, you, you, you mentioned yourself, right? I mean, you, so you, you know, you wanted to, you to, obviously an athlete, right? You were playing baseball, football. Right. I didn't hear basketball, but you may have been playing that too. Basketball and track. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so, you know, so you, you got, and, and then you wind up with like, uh, you know, you got a Kepka, right? And he would much right. rather, he would much rather say that he's won a world series than a major championship. Right? <laughs> There's no, no doubt, no doubt. But, uh, but, but it, it, you know, it's interesting. Yeah. You know, and you got, uh, you got Kepka that's, you know, so I don't know, is it a head game now or is it an actual injury or is it his head telling him that he's got an injury because, you know, he's now complaining about the knee and it, it, it's, it's really interesting to hear you kind of describe uh, you know, the biomechanics of that and, and how they're going and, you know, over swinging. And it's, you know, d- d- I mean, do you really have to hit the ball that far to score good? I mean, I, I don't think so. I think w- once you make it, and I, I don't know and probably never will, what it feels like to be a PGA uh, Tour pro. Uh, I got a few years before 50, so maybe I'll make the Champions Tour. You never know. Uh, <laughs> but lofty goals, you know. But, uh, but you know, you've got these guys that are working and twerking. And you, you, know, you said talking about, you know, the kids are watching these people. And, and it's obvious, you know, it's apparent that they're going to imitate and they're kind of going to go and just repeat what these guys are doing. And, you know, what's right. that going to do to now future generations that are coming up and playing? And are we going to, is it, I, I, burnout's probably not a fair term to use. But is it going to exhaust them or their body and energy before they even get a chance to get to, the, you know, being good? Right. Well, there's no question. I, I think, I mean, you didn't see the wraparound follow through like you do in the Hogan, mm-hmm. Nicholas, mm-hmm. Watson, Palmer, all those, you know, all those greats, even Norman. You know, he didn't over rotate his shoulders. His arms might have dropped down his back a little bit, but, you know, he was stopping his hips and shoulders. It's. It's when Tiger came along, that's when you're seeing everybody with all these wraparound, over-rotated shoulders. And, and uh, so I just think it's, it's creating, if you keep watching them as kids, you're creating a, a model of injuries. Yeah. You know, yeah. whether, whether it's a knee, whether it's an ankle, a lower back. And swinging as hard as they do, um, gosh, you know, I don't know what it does to, to wrists and things like that. Didn't Kepka have a wrist injury too? Oh, or yeah. Was it just, yeah. No, no. I think, had a, I think last year he had a wrist injury. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. So, it, so it's interesting that you say that. So, do you ever tell your students like to to watch a golfer, or, and and if if you do, is it somebody that's currently playing, or you tell them to watch old footage? Uh, I mean, so for example, would you tell somebody to, hey, you know what, go go to YouTube or go to the internet or whatever, and and pull up Ben Hogan and watch Ben Hogan? Or I, I'm sure you wouldn't say you brought up Trevino. Like I don't know if anybody would tell right. anybody to watch Trevino because nobody can do what Trevino did, right? I mean, it's right. very unique. So, uh, or but is it like uh, like Adam Scott, right? I mean, okay, oh, boy, I may have I may ha- I may have a little man crush on Adam. <laughs> sorry, sorry if that offends anybody, but it's like, but that dude swing is so. I mean, it is pure, right? And, right. And, and, I would, and I wouldn't necessarily compare Adam Scott's swing to Ben Hogan's swing in the aesthetics of it. or well, Mechanically, I wouldn't compare. But aesthetically speaking, just in, in just how smooth and pure that it looks, I would compare their swings in that nature. Right. Well, there's no question. I mean, you could probably take 20 golfers you know, of all varying handicap levels, throw a tour pro in there, bring someone who's never played golf before and they'll pick out the tour pro because it, it'll look athletic, it'll look rhythmical, it'll look smooth and so on and so forth. I love Adam Scott's swing too. It's just that he gets a little over-rotated himself, mm-hmm. not quite as bad as Tiger. Mm-hmm. But if you think back er, when Adam Scott first hit the tour, I think he and, and Tiger were both seeing Butch. They looked yep. very, yep. very. They looked very, very similar. You know, in their swinging motion back then. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Probably, other than you know, I'd tell anybody to go watch Mac O'Grady uh, if you want to look at a biomechanical great swing. Uh, I've seen him hit shots that just blew my mind, uh, and then turn around and do that left-handed. But you know, as far as I would say, Sneed would be a great swing to look at for power, grace, rhythm. Uh, shot making. Um, Watson, I liked Watson. Yeah. He was a little up. He had a little upright arm swing on the back swing, but but there's a guy that knew how to create speed. And you remember how tight and quick he would stop the swing. Oh yeah. And you don't hear about Tom Watson at age. Was he almost seventy now? Sure. Complaining about bad backs. 
know, yeah, no, not, not at all. He never over rotated. Yeah. So, in your opinion, then Scott, you think Rory's going to have some back issues in uh, later years? Uh, possibly. I don't think he kind of gets cranked around quite as far as Tiger, but um, it's a simple way to fix it. It's just nobody's ever. Uh, that's what kind of blew me away about Tiger going from one instructor to one instructor to one instructor. You know, keep going. Mm -hmm. Nobody addressed and nobody yeah. the back problem. Gotcha. You know. They, well, they, they, when the horse is running, you got to ride it, right? What's that? When the horse is running, you, 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 hey, run it to the finish, man. And it's like, why, you know, how, how do you screw with a good thing, right? I mean, right. you got to think, I mean, yeah, it, and again, it's, it's not offensive at all. I mean, it's just reality. I mean, you, you, you know, that you get that horse in the stable and, you know, n not to say that the, you know, Hank, Butch, uh, you know, they didn't need, and we could go down the list, right? But, uh, they didn't need necessarily to build their name. But I mean, once you get that rubber stamp there, I mean, it's kind of like, okay, this is let it happen. <laughs> It's right. going to work out. So, yeah. Well, I mean, Tiger kind of put Hank on the the, the map. He certainly. Um, uh, what's what was the next guy? Toronto Blank, the young guy. Uh, oh, uh, Foley, Foley, Sean Foley. Oh, yeah, he yeah. put him on yeah. the map, and oh, nobody knew who Sean Foley was until Tiger came along. No. Right. I no. mean, that that was it, well. I shouldn't say nobody. He was not the name that he has today without Tiger Wood, and, and probably right. still isn't. I mean, right. to, to be honest, I mean, that was definitely his spotlight, so, yeah. Right, and he probably wouldn't have got commanded the rate he probably charges either. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like his stock income was... level went up after that, too, but, you know, I think one of the best things Tiger's done is he's kind of, as far as we know, kind of gone back on his own Yeah. and doesn't really see anybody and just, okay, well, let's just hit golf shots again. All right. He's got a great world's greatest imagination, eye hand coordination, so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, he doesn't need to get into the technical highlights of, you know, what a golf instructor might put him through. Yeah, well, maybe. I don't know if he's got anybody to bounce ideas off of, but I don't, you know, you know, if he just goes back to his instincts. You, you want to uh, you want to get your number out there in case he's listening? <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, just in case. Yeah, we'll, we'll drop that at the end. We'll tell people how to get a hold of you. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll redo and drop it. We'll just elongate his career by cutting the follow-through shorter is what we'll do. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. exactly. Give, him, yeah. give him time to catch Jack. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to have to hurry, man. And then this 2020 yeah. has definitely screwed that. It screwed it up for a lot of guys, you know. But except for Rom, I mean, Rom is, uh, he's definitely taking advantage of that thing. And, you know, I'm surprised. It, it's interesting for me to watch John Rom about how short his backswing is and how much power that guy gets through the ball. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's I like have, right I, here. And then he's just firing through that. It's crazy. I haven't, I haven't really slowed it down or looked at it. In, I'm sure he's downsetting his wrists. Yeah, and, then, and you know, so it's like cracking a bull if he's setting them and then uncocking them so fast that he's it's getting whipped through there. Do you remember a guy named Dan Pohl? No, he played not. in the eights. He came out of U of A. Let's see, I'm going to be 63. He's got to be 65 now. Okay. But when when the PGA Tour, I think it was 1980, the, was the first year the PGA Tour kept statistics, and he the first two years he led the driving distance at about 276, 278. <laughs> <laughs> now it's 340 which, you know <laughs> which is what they hit those driving irons now yeah you know, sure 75 is the two iron you know yeah. <laughs> and he had, you know dan had a, had a nice big turn of his shoulders and hips and he had a decent length arm swing but the, the shaft was like a lightning rod almost sticking straight up in the air because he didn't cock his wrist on the back swing but on the way down he cocked him almost like hogan so now he's got now he's got like a buggy whip or a bull whip kind of action where it downsets and then unloads so quick that he had tremendous speed. Sure. So that's interesting. Hey Scott, so what are some some common misconceptions you see with uh, some of those weekend warriors? Like you know you got a beginner like you had today or whatnot. You talked about the first thing you say is you know do you have any injuries we got to avoid? But what are some of the things you know for our listeners that may be trying to pick up a tip here to help them you know shave a couple of strokes or whatnot? What are some of the easy things that just you obviously with your tiger you know what you're talking about with tiger you can see things and you see a lot of this stuff. What do you, what are some tips you got from some of these guys? Well, a lot of it you know. It's kind of weird. Most people that come to me want full swing help. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, I've had people that tell me that they shoot 100. I said, well, okay, well, how's your chipping and putting? Oh, that's what saves me. <laughs> and they, you shoot 100. You can't be doing anything well. And, you know, you can't chip and putt well and shoot 100. Right? Dan, D Dan, don't hang up. Don't hang up, Dan. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, you know, for example, you know, how many three putts around do you have? Oh, six or seven. Oh. I'm going, okay, well, I, without even watching you play, if you go to YouTube, look up golf putting speed drills and pick out three or four that are interesting because you go out on the putting green and do a speed drill for 20 minutes, you're going to get bored. So go to the next one and go to the next one, go to the next one. But three putting is set up by the speed of the first putt being off. You know, most people aren't hit, you know, a ranked beginner might hit it five feet offline from 30 feet. But mm -hmm. anybody that's played a little bit of golf that's having a ton of three putts, it's usually this, they've knocked it too far by or not left it too far short. They got one they can miss and they end up missing it. Now, mm -hmm. granted, they say I'm missing a three or four or five footer. But my question is, why do you have such a long second butt? Because your speed's off. And that's where most people, most high handicappers could probably knock off a handful of strokes in two weeks if they went out and practiced on the putting green and worked on their speed. Just hmm. speed, 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 speed. And, then, you know, let's say you have three, six three putts around and you get it down to five. So now we're, our handicap's five lower. But if your speed's that much better, you're probably making one, maybe even two other 10 footers, eight footers, 12 footers that you weren't making before. So really eliminating five out of six three putts could be six or seven strokes off their handicap. Mm. In a heartbeat. And the other thing is, is learn how to chip. <laughs> you know, the guy that leads the, the greens and regulation uh, on the tour will average 72, 73% a year, which is a roughly 13 greens around. Well, the guy that hits the most greens on the tour still has to chip five times. Sure. Or at least maybe he puts from the fringe once, but he's got to, you know, chip four times. So a 20 handicapper is only going to hit three or four greens, and I can help him get better at that. But he's not going to probably, he's not a real avid practicer. He's not going to get to where he averages 10 or 12. So let's work on your short game. <laughs> Great advice. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Cal. So, so when, when you have people come in, so you know, it's like you know, it, it's it's. it's it's true, right? I mean, it's cool to hit the long drive. Right. And e even if it's a little bit off, if it's a little bit of a miss, as long as it's long, you, I mean, you feel good about it. You know, like you, it's like, you know, it's kind of the macho thing to do, you right. know, and it's cool, right? Uh, but, but so so would you ever back some? Well, I guess let me re-ask the question. Um, would you ever take somebody like, hey, let's go out on the course and let's play a few holes and then let me evaluate you and then we'll get there? I, or, or is that kind of just the setup and whatever relationship you're getting into as far as how long you're going to teach them? Right. If, if I know they're, they're going to make a commitment to, to come and, and take lessons and practice, and that's the other thing is they got to practice in between, yeah. oh, I'll take them on the golf course and, and it gives me a chance to see what really happens. Because, like I said, their perception of reality and what's happening isn't always the same. Sure. I mean, you've got a 20 handicapper that thinks he chips and putts well, and usually I, half the time I can say <laughs> that's the, it's actually the problem, you know. Um, sculling, it o sculling it over the green is not chipping well. <laughs> right. <laughs> or just getting on is not chipping well. Right. And having a three, 30 footer where they can still three putt. Yeah. Um, but their chipping saves them. But, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, I mean, if, if more people work just on their short game, you know, their handicaps would go down. I mean, you wonder why with all the, the video equipment like I've got, I just ordered a, a Mevo launch monitor uh, just so I can help people gap their clubs and so on and so forth. But all this technology that we have, why doesn't the average golfer's handicap go down? Yeah. Because nobody practices their short game. Hey, Al, Al, yeah. Alan Iverson said it best, practice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and I, it's kind of funny. I, I tell people all the time, I said, you know, one, one of the, the parts of aspects of punny, putting that everybody overlooks is green reading. So if you guys go, are you guys going to go out to the golf course or mm -hmm. uh, this weekend at all? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yep. Okay. If you just spend some time on the putting green and watch everybody that walks on there, count how many people actually squat down and read a putt. Normally, the routine is get the three balls out of the sleeve, plop, 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 take a gander at the hole, whack the first one, see what it does, then make your adjustment. Oh, I made the second one, and I almost made the third. I'm putting great. Mm -hmm. The last time I played in a tournament, I didn't get a three-ball, one-man scramble. <laughs> I kept you know, the next one. So the, the only time you usually see a high air handicap squat down and read a putt on a practice green is when they're in a putting contest for either pride, yeah. sodas, beer, or money. Mm -hmm. You know, and 
to become a good putter, you've got to practice green reading. And mm -hmm. then you got to figure out, you got to learn how to read green. So uh, I do a short game boot camp that's about three hours periodically, and the first hour is on putting. And we don't even look at the stroke. You know, I'll, I'll look at their strokes a little bit, but I'll use uh, the string and I'll use a yardstick where they can mm -hmm. put on the back of it. Uh, I'll, but I go through green reading and speed are the two things I'll, I'll emphasize more than anything mm -hmm. and show them how to read greens, how to walk into it, you know, uh, whether that, whether it will check their aim, whether or not they should be aiming the ball or very few people should just get over the ball and aim the putter because they're really bad at it. So most people should squat behind the ball and get a line on it and aim it. You know, and you probably got, I don't know, what, a third to half the tour players aim the ball. The best players in the world are aiming the ball, you know. Yeah. So So you do a three-hour putting three hour, boot camp? Short, it's a short game boot camp. Short I'll, do an hour, and I'll do an hour on putting, and I'll do uh, the other two hours in a chip and run shot, a pitch shot, and bunker shots. And I usually keep I usually keep it to five or six people. And yeah. if it fills up, I usually have, I might have two in one day, but, uh, and it's like 99 bucks. It's a cheap, inexpensive deal. And I don't, I, when I first started doing, I was handing out little notebooks and pens so they could take notes, but I'm giving so much information too fast almost that I like, just, dude, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to hit it. shots here. I can't take notes <laughs> and hit. <laughs> I know. So finally what I did is I just got a list of notes and I said, I'll email you the notes. Oh yeah. Nice. I'll cover everything we covered. And I'll email them to you. So that's what I ended up doing. So they didn't didn't have to sit there and try to write it down. And all yeah, of a sudden, yeah, sure. that, yeah, if it's anything like me, I'm writing something down. I didn't hear what the person said while I'm writing it down, writing right. what I was thinking down. So, but um, but yeah, I just the average golfer does not spend enough time chipping and putting. You know, they want to. They got a slice. They want to fix the slice. Okay, we'll fix the slice. But after that. Can we go do chipping and putting? You know, because that's where you're really going to lower your score. Um, I mean, I'll tell people that I, I had won the Arizona Open, and the following year, it was up at Desert Mountain. Are you familiar with Desert Mountain since you've been in Arizona a little bit? Uh, I'm trying to think about it. Is that on? So I know that, that uh, Papago, you're on the. We're in Phoenix. Yeah, so but you're, Phoenix. On the, you're on the east side of Camelback, right? And then is uh, Desert Mountain on the west side of Camelback? De Desert Mountain is way north of Silverleaf. So, you know, you're up against the McDowell Mountains there at Silverleaf. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So if you go up Pima Road all the way up into Carefree, it's, it's up there. It's, it's the only facility in the United States that has six Jack Nicklaus golf, design golf courses. Uh, what, what's the little biker city up there where they have the bike run and the, all the Harleys and stuff that come uh -oh. in? I, I, uh, I know. It was, I'm it's be called Greasewood Flats. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Like a little biker bar. Uh, no, not the bar. It's the area. But I think that that place is in the area. But they do a big like um, a big uh, like a Harley rally there. Oh, oh you're th you're thinking of Cave Creek. Yes. Okay. So yeah. not not there. No, no. Okay. But it's, it's it's literally due east of there, about two miles. Oh, so it is There's kind of there. He's like, yeah, he's like, no, right there. You, you missed it by two yards. You're way off. <laughs> You're way off. <laughs> you aimed your rangefinder at the wrong hole. Yeah, exactly. They, this is a, this is like a weekend hacker and a professional. So to me, true. I'm like, shit, so I nailed true. it. He's like, God, you couldn't have missed that any worse. <laughs> So anyway, well, back to the story. I'd hey, yeah, sorry. Well, the, ne the next year I shot 66, the opening round, and I only hit 11 greens. And I said, I just said, there's the value of short game. Yeah. I mean, I, I did make a couple eagles. I did have a couple par fives and two and make eagles. But but my point was is I missed I missed seven greens and got up and down six out of seven times and made enough birdies and eagles to get to six under. But that, I said, that's chipping and putting. Well, we've mentioned it many times. I mean, look at Phil Mickelson. I mean, that dude, I right. mean, if you say, hey, what's Phil known for, right? And it, I mean, he is the, he's the wedge master, you know I mean? Right. It's like, come on, you know, so. But it must, yeah. uh, must be an ASU thing. That's running your guy's blood out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, well, back when uh, a, there was a golf course called ASU Karsten that was just off the, right next to the campus. It closed. You were there, right? Didn't you yeah, work? I was teaching there for about seven years, and then yeah. I came over. It'll be two years at Papago, mm -hmm. um, but Gage Karsten closed a little over a year ago. And at the back of the, that range is where the, the team had their own facility, which was okay, but it's nothing like what they have now. 
and I watched John Rahm hitting flop shots off off a tight lie of, of Bermuda grass with a four iron. You know, <laughs> flop shots. I I can do it out of a. I can make a a slight uphill bunker shot with a two iron. I can make it look like a lob wedge is coming out of it, but I got to have sand and an uphill lie. Yeah. I'm not gonna have flop shots with a four iron off of a wow. tight lie in Bermuda grass. It's just. I, I, mean, I can barely hit a four iron off a tee, much less uh, trying to flop. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean he's. He's he's the, that kid's got so much talent. Yeah. When, when he's in college, he was pissed off if he was even par during the round. Oh, he yeah. was mad, literally mad. How many, how many clubs do you think that guy snapped over his knee? <laughs> I, I don't know. I never <laughs> never heard of him doing it, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's yeah. a few. <laughs> That's, good That's good stuff. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. That's yeah, good stuff. for sure. Uh, so I tell you, I got another question for you. Then we'll we'll circle back with you. We've uh, we've kept you on for quite some time, and thanks so much for being uh, generous with your time. I know it's, uh, it's your, your time's valuable. Uh, does Rory McIlroy ever make it back to number one? Oh boy. Uh, oh yeah, I think so. What's he? What did he drop to? Number two? Yeah, number two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. number two. I I don't know how. I, I haven't followed. I mean, Rom hasn't been winning a ton of tournaments like Rory has. I don't know how he lost the number one it, it must be that you know he had a few tournaments that finished in the 30s and, and ron yeah, must be top tending it every week pretty much yeah yeah, yeah pretty much so, so they got to be close you know yeah it, it's close yeah, i mean all it takes is for rory to get a win and he's there and i mean there, there's i think there's like four or five people that if they win this week maybe seven or eight if they win this you know if the next tournament that they win they're going to write to number one, right? right? So I think we're gonna have a lot of changes coming out of. Uh, well, how, how old is Rory? 28, 29? I mean, yeah, he's around there. Yeah, thirty, yeah, around thirty, give or take. Yeah. So. Right. Right. I mean, it's he's not even out of his prime, so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That the amazing thing to me, though, with all the the golf instruction, and we you know we got video, and you know I think the golf instruction has gotten better over the years. Um, how young these guys come out and how seasoned they are right out of college age or even at 20, 21, 22, the Jordan yeah. speeds, and these guys skipping two years of college and coming out and winning right away. Yeah. When I played yeah. on the tour, you didn't see guys in their 21, 22, 23, very rarely winning tournaments. It took a while, like to become a journeyman. And yeah. then in the mid to maybe the late twenties and close to thirties, when you started seeing guys winning more tournaments, right. but these guys yeah. come out, some of it's the junior golf programs, the AJGA and, and, yep. and FCWT and all these different uh, junior programs where they can get so seasoned in, in playing tournaments um, by the time they even get to college. Um, where when I grew up in Arizona and we had, you know, six one-day Mondays in the summer and you quali we didn't even have to qualify to go to the Junior World Championship in San Diego. but And then uh, maybe the USGA Junior and, and, a, and that was it. You know, yeah. it wasn't these kids can play in something all the time and travel. It's yeah. crazy. Exactly. But, well, they're used it, to it, right? I mean, it's, but in, I wouldn't say it's easy, especially not during COVID, but you know, prior to COVID, I mean, it's kind of easy to get around and just with being able to communicate not everything that's happening. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot more, it's golf. That, so the good thing I think is that, you know, it's it, it, looking at historically, I mean, golf is a lot more accessible and I think they're continue uh, that that's the good thing that's happening is it's continuously trying to make it accessible. And then folks like yourself, it's like, okay, well, how do I get how do I get better? And it's not the hey, you got to swing like this, you know. And, and you know, and reading up about you, it's not the okay. Here, forget what you know. I'm going to teach you how to swing. I'm going to teach you your, the golf swing. And it's like, well that's proven that that's really not the way to go, right? It's no, no, no. Let me see what you got. Let me see what you're working with. And then let me help you mold, uh, you know, your swing into something repeatable and keep you out of trouble. Right. Right. Well, the, the person who wins a tournament has the best misses. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so, you know, good shots are good shots. Yeah. You'd love to hit good shots every time, but how good are the bad ones? And that's really what it is, is, it's like damage control. Yeah. Right. How can I get your swing to where you've got good misses? And then you can, and, and if you can chip and putt, you can play, mm -hmm. you know? I, sure. I, I like it, man. It's it chip and putt. I'm telling you, Scott, the next time I'm in Arizona, uh, I'm looking you up and okay. uh, I, I want to stop by, man. Maybe we'll do a live <laughs> recording and uh, get some video sure. uh, out, outside and uh, 
We'll work with that. I would love that three hour boot camp you got. I mean, that could, yeah. uh, D- Dan's going to need like a, a 30 day boot camp. So <laughs> he's going to need more than, he's going to need more than three hours. I can tell what's you that. I can, Dan, what's your handicap? Oh, it's God. What is it? Cal probably like at like 20. 30, yeah. 30, 30, 20. I'm 30. horrible. I'm horrible. <laughs> drink, drink more bourbon. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, hold on. Can you say that one more time, please? <laughs> drink more bourbon. <laughs> The yeah. Scott Watkins, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hey, Scott, Scott. So we, we've been uh, we've been going. We've kept you for almost an hour. I know your time's valuable. Valuable. I think uh, Nate Lashley is probably waiting out there uh, to get some work in, isn't he? Well, I'm, I'll see him again Friday morning, and then on Sunday he's heading for the PGA. So we'll see. Oh, you put some day work in today, did you? Yeah, we were out at seven thirty this morning. So ah, nice, nice, Very nice. Yeah. Uh, we're not, we're not asking for any insider information. So, uh, but I, but I hope things look good. Uh, he's definitely going to a more temperate climate, uh, going from Arizona to, uh, to San Francisco. So that's gotta be a positive for him. He's something to look forward to, but, uh, Hey, wish him all the best, man. When you see him, tell him good luck. All right. And, well. um, hey, before we jump, uh, and not that we're trying to get rid of it, but we would love to have you on again, by the way, I'm sure Absolutely. everybody's going to love the, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure everybody's going to love listening to this. Uh, we'll mm-hmm. be sure to plug you. Uh, we'll be on uh, Birdies and Bourbon Podcast. There'll be multiple sites that we'll be on. Uh, we'll be on Instagram at Birdies underscore Bourbon. Uh, we'll be on Twitter at Birdies underscore Bourbon. But uh, more importantly, and the reason that uh, that we're able to be here, Scott, why don't you plug yourself and uh, give us a rundown? Where can people find you? Uh, and what do you want them to know, man? Yeah, I'm, I'm at Papago Golf Course in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, my website is scottwatkinsgolf.com. I do have my own little Twitter account with uh, a little over a 1,000 people following me now, so unfortunately, I don't. There you go. Wait a minute. Here's my soda. There you go. <laughs> um, he's, still, he's still working. He's still working. That's right. I have a, I've got a friend, Alexis Fox, who's now living in Houston that kind of helped me get my my Instagram going and it, it was going better when she was still here <laughs> posting for me, taking the videos and posting for me. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I got to learn how to do it myself. But, um, but yeah, if, if, if you're in town and, and need some help with your golf game, I'd be more than happy to help anybody that wants to come by and see me. So, that's awesome. um, so anyway, that's, that's who I am. <laughs> Sounds great, Scott. Thank you so much for joining. Really appreciate it. Look forward to talking okay. to you again. Uh, we only scratched the surface today. I mean, there's so much knowledge yeah. with you, and, and you entertained us. I mean, those are great stories. And man, yeah, <laughs> uh, we got to get take hey, Cal. We got to get chipping and putting, buddy. That's for sure. Hey, right. so but before we go, before we go, uh, I know he's got a Trevino story in there somewhere. Oh. So just, just, just drop it a teaser, drop it a teaser. The next one I'm, I'm getting the, I'm getting the Trevino story out of him. I'm just saying. <laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> so, so can we commit to that, man? Yeah, hey, okay. Just, just make it up. Even if it's not true, nobody knows. <laughs> okay. so hey, Scott. My Reno story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're getting the Reno story next time. So uh, if, any, hey, if anybody wants to make a wager on this, Feel free to DM us, DM Scott Watkins. Uh, hey, we, we could put some money down on this thing. Who knows what's coming out of this next time? Uh, <laughs> Scott, uh, thanks so much for coming on. All right. And I uh, hope the listeners enjoyed it. I'm sure they did. And I'm looking forward to getting a little deeper in this thing. Cheers. Okay. Cheers, Scott. Cheers. Cheers.